Hi there, I'm Dave Taylor from LincolnConspirators.com. Today is July 7th, 2020, and on this exact date, 155 years ago, four of the convicted conspirators in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln were executed in Washington, D.C. I am in Geneva, Florida, at Geneva Cemetery, visiting the grave of one of the people who were executed 155 years ago, almost to this very moment. His name was Lewis Thornton Powell, and on the night of Lincoln's assassination, Powell had broken into the home of Secretary of State William Seward, brutally stabbing him in his bed along with four others. Miraculously, Seward and the rest of his household survived, but Lewis Powell went on trial and was convicted of plotting in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and attempting to assassinate the Secretary of State. Now, as I am here in Geneva Cemetery, I'm going to show you his grave momentarily and read to you a uh, brief overview of what it was like 155 years ago, almost to the moment, when Lewis Powell breathed his very last. And the text that I'm going to use for that is a wonderful book called American Brutus by Michael Kaufman, along with another book called Alias Pain by Betty Owensby, the best biography and the only biography out there exclusively about Lewis Thornton Powell. So first I'm going to turn the camera around and show you the grave of Lewis Powell. He is buried here in Geneva Cemetery. And next to his grave, I have a, my iPad going with an animation of the events that occurred on this date uh, 155 years ago. I'm gonna read to you now from American Brutus by Mike Kaufman uh, with excerpts included from Alias Pain by Betty Owensby. This was the scene almost to the minute that occurred 155 years ago right now. A hundred or more civilians waited under a blistering sun as General Hartrampt and his staff emerged from the prison cell block. Following was Mary Surratt, dressed in black with bonnet and veil, too feeble to walk. She was supported at each arm by an army officer. George Atzerodt came next, also propped up by officers. David Harold in light pants and a cloth hat followed Atzerodt. Like the others, he appeared too weak to walk unassisted. But the last prisoner was the most remarkable. Lewis Powell stepped through the prison door looking bold, erect, and confident in his blue navy crew shirt. A sudden gust took his hat, and Reverend Gillette, walking beside him, placed it back on his head. Thank you, doctor, the prisoner said with a faint smile. I won't be needing it much longer. Powell walked to the gallows with an almost casual air and bounded up the 13 steps to the platform. Armchairs had been placed there for the condemned prisoners. In front of each swaying in the breeze was a noose. The prisoners took their seats as the soldiers knelt around them, binding their legs with strips of white cloth. General Hartranth read the findings and sentences. When the general finished reading, Reverend Gillette stepped forward to address the crowd. He said that Powell had asked him to thank General Hartranth and his staff publicly for their kind treatment, for not an unkind word, look, or gesture had been given him by anyone in the prison. Reverend Gillette then offered a prayer which brought Powell to tears. A newspaper reporter described the scene. Payne walked to the scaffold with as firm a tread as any criminal that we ever saw, but even he broke down before the curtain fell, sitting with his strong neck slanted upward, with his eyes directed towards some part of the sky. He maintained for a time the imperturbable expression that he has so constantly worn since his arrest, but before the ceremony was over, his face was suffused with crimson and tears streamed down his cheeks as he looked up at the sky. The nooses were adjusted, and Powell was the first to receive his. When the noose was being put upon his neck, the hangman, Christian Rath, turned to Powell and said, I want you to die quick, Payne. Powell replied, you know best, Captain, and his voice was calm and matter-of-fact. The white hanging hoods were pulled down over their faces for the last time, and Powell stood straight with his head held high. At 25 minutes past one, Captain Rath stood in front of the gallows and motioned for all attendants to step away, away from the trap doors. With everyone, everything looking in order, he raised his hands and brought them together three times in a clapping motion. On the third clap, the four soldiers beneath the platform knocked the supports out from the prisoners. The doors fell with a loud slam, and the four bodies jerked violently at the ends of their rope. Harold twitched for a moment, and wet himself. Atzerodt's stomach heaved in a brief convulsion. Mary Surratt, her death appeared instantaneous. 
But the spectators were aghast as Lewis Powell twisted and writhed and struggled for life. He kicked for a full five minutes and those standing close could see the rope cutting deeply into his dark purple skin. 20 minutes after the drop, all four were pronounced dead. The bodies were cut down without ceremony and placed in pine gun boxes that, and hastily buried beside the gallows. The death of Abraham Lincoln had been avenged. That ends my reading from American Brutus by Michael Kaufman and Alias Payne by Betty Owensby. While I've been reading, the exact time of the hanging has come and gone, 1.25 in the afternoon. Now, even though Lewis Powell and the other three were executed and immediately buried next to the gallows, Powell would be the last one to be officially buried uh, over a hundred years later in 1994. You see, it wasn't until 1869, four years after the conspirators' deaths, that their bodies were released to their families. But Lewis's family lived here in very rural, isolated Florida, and they had no idea that in 1869, they could recover their loved one's remains. And so at the time, an undertaker by the name of Joseph Gawler took possession of Powell's body and held onto it, hoping that a relative of Payne's or Powell's would eventually show up so that he could get paid for his services and turn the body over. But over t almost 20 years went by. And in 1884, the cemetery where Joseph Gawler had put Powell's remains was closing down. And so all of the bodies in that cemetery that were not claimed were going to be put in a mass grave at Rock Creek Cemetery. And so the preparations were made for Powell's body to join them. And in fact, his body very much did. However, for a reason unknown to us, Joseph Gawler decided to take possession of Lewis Powell's skull. Just his skull. He donated it to the Army Medical Museum, which at that point, oddly enough, was held on the third floor of Ford's Theater the building having been confiscated by the government. The head was on display alongside the vertebrae of the assassin himself, John Wilkes Booth, that had been removed during his autopsy. In the 1890s, Powell's skull somehow got mixed up in the, into a collection of Native American remains that had been added to the Army Medical Museum after the many Indian Wars and transferred to the Smithsonian Anthropology Department. And it stayed at the Smithsonian at the, um, for many, many, many years. In fact, it was not until 1992 when Congress packed, passed an act requiring federal institutions to go through their Native American remains in order to repatriate some of the remains if the tribes wanted them back. And so an anthropologist at the Smithsonian started going through the many pieces of bone and skulls and other things that were in the Army Medical, that were in the Smithsonian collection. And the gentleman by the name of Stuart Speaker, one day in 1992, came across Lewis Powell's skull. Hold it up so that you can see it better. The skull was identified as L. Payne, executed July 7, 1865, for his involvement in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And Stuart Speaker immediately contacted Michael Kaufman and Betty Owensby, the two people whose books I just read from. And together, they identified that this was indeed the skull of Lewis Thornton Powell. The way they did this was by using photographic analysis, while also noticing that Powell had been kicked in the head by a mule as a child and had broken his jaw. And they could see the fracture that had been fixed. It took a while, but in 1994, the head, Lewis Powell's head, was finally given to the remaining Powell descendants located here in Florida. Now, Lewis Powell did not have any direct descendants himself, and so it was given to great nieces and great nephews. It was put in a box, custom made, and buried right here. Laid into the ground right here. The reason that Geneva Cemetery was decided as the final resting place for Lewis Thornton Powell was because his mother, Patience Carolyn Powell had been buried here after her death in 1885. And so it seemed very fitting that Powell should be buried here beside his mother. And so that's it. This is Geneva Cemetery, the final resting place of Lewis Powell's skull. And while I feel sympathy 
for the waste of this young man's life, he being only 21 years old. When he signed up to join John Wilkes Booth's conspiracy, first to abduct Abraham Lincoln and then to assassinate him, Lewis Thornton Powell wrote his own death warrant. And so today is a day of justice. This is Dave Taylor, July 7th in Geneva Cemetery, Geneva, Florida.